Lucia, you and I, in a sense, are very complementary with an E. Uh, I have looked at the panoply of all different theories without any um, capacity to evaluate them at all and wanted to present each one in the best way in my Landscape of Consciousness uh, paper. Uh, you have been uh, one of the leaders in evaluating con consciousness by um, doing what's called an adversarial collaboration, uh, particularly with some of the major theories um, that have, uh, uh, have, have worked together. So tell me about the way of thinking for evaluating theories, number one, and number two, specifically about the adversarial collaboration. Yeah. So whenever you have this plethora of <laughs> theories, as you had, as you had uh, demonstrated, the question naturally comes, which one of those better adjust to explain the data, right? And this is what the adversarial collaborations are trying to do. The idea here would be, can we take different theories with opposing views that try to explain exactly the same phenomenon, in this case, the phenomenology of consciousness. Now they need to make contradictory predictions. First of all, they need to make predictions. Not, not necessarily every theory makes predictions, <coughs> so that's, that's a prerequisite. They need to make contradictory predictions, and they need to be testable, right? Because some of the predictions might not be testable, right? And they need to be testable with present methods also, right? Because again, you can think of, you can make a prediction, but you may not have the, the methods currently to, to evaluate that. So with all that baggage... Yeah, so you have f at least four levels of constraints. <laughs> exactly, which already makes it complicated. Yeah. We started seven years ago a project called Adversarial Collaborations, and this is inspired from the model of Daniel Kahneman. And what he proposed was whenever you have opposing views and you want to find out, you know, and you want to get it right as opposed to be right, yeah. you unite with your adversary come up with a specific set of predictions, a specific set of hypotheses, a specific set of methods to evaluate those, and then run an experiment and, as, and agree ex ante, before the experiment is done, on what kind of results will validate your theory and what kind of results will invalidate your theory, right? And then you also agree to publish the results no matter whether the result <coughs> is right, wrong, mm. or in the middle, right? So it has a, it, it has a specific format. Right? The next part is that mo instead of building on the model of confirmation of a theory, it builds more on the model of falsification of a theory. Right? So in this case, we don't take both sources of evidence as meaning the same. So if I confirm a theory in this case, it doesn't mean that the theory is necessarily correct. If I disconfirm the theory, it means that the theory has a problem. Mm. So that is much more informative sure. than in the other <coughs> case. Right? So mm. this is, and this is important because it's a different form of doing science, you know, where falsification is what we're looking for. So what did we, did, uh, what did we do seven years ago? We took two theories, in this case, uh, Integrated Information Theory uh, by Giulio Tononi and um, Global Workspace Theory by Stanislas Dehan. We team up with them, both of them. So they were the ones who helped us in hashing out the predictions and hashing out the outcomes that would, in their, in their mind, um, falsify or um, confirm their theories. And we develop one set of experiments, in this case, two set of experiments that complement each other. In the first experiment, which is the one that we just published, we aim at the question of what is the neural activity that explains the most, that explains the richness of our experience. So why do, why do you now look to me like a face and not like a book? <laughs> why do you now look to me like as a male and not as a female? Or in this orientation, not on this other orientation? And why I can continue seeing you despite the time passes. Yeah. So why did you, why, you know, what is the magic that keeps you in my consciousness, right? So this was the, the uh, questions that the first experiment tried to answer. The second experiment, which is a format of a video game, is trying to answer a, a more typical question within the field of consciousness, which is the, what distinguishes, what, which brain activity distinguishes between seeing, uh, seeing you in this case right. versus not seeing you, mm. right? Um, now, what, what makes adversarial collaborations very, challenging is that you need to find methods that or, or ways to test both theories in ways that are fair for both theories right because otherwise you end up with a with an outcome that you know tilts the, the balance you know just by how you measure it or, or how you tested it <coughs> so it was very important for us to connect mm. first of all with the theory leaders and make sure that the predictions that they made were informative make sure also that the tests 
that the experiments that we uh, develop were uh, you know, were good to test the, those hypotheses and that the analysis that we perform were appropriate to test their hypotheses, right? Um, we also needed to find out what kind of neural measures we needed to evaluate for this theory to be confirmed or disconfirmed. So we agreed on using three different methods, in this case fMRI, which has a very good spatial resolution but very bad temporal resolution, um, magnetoencephalography and EEG, these are non-invasive measures to, to, to measure electrical activity in a, uh, with a very good time result manner, but, very, but not as good uh, spatial resolution. And we also included patients that had epilepsy, in which, in, in which we could in, um, measure directly from the patient's brain with precise temporal and spatial resolution. And the idea was that through a combination of methods, we could <coughs> determine which areas of the brain as proposed to the theories, were more engaged into consciousness. And uh, we tested three kinds of hypotheses. One is where the, the where the theories claim that the content of consciousness should be. Um, I, uh, GNW predicted that prefrontal cortex was necessary to, um, uh, to, for all of the contents of consciousness, whereas IAT said that uh, the you know, early visual areas, or the posterior hot zone, as they call it, was sufficient um, for uh, conscious experience. The second one was, what are the mechanisms by which I continue seeing you now? Like, how do we endure in my, yeah. in my conscious experience, right? Um, and there they made interesting uh, predictions. It was important for us also to put the theories outside of their comfort zone. Why, why am I saying this? It's because often, up until that point, theories have been mostly measuring consciousness from, you know, what is the difference in your brain whenever a stimulus enters into your awareness? But they had not necessarily paid enough attention to the simple question of like, well, but then once the stimulus is into my awareness, yeah. what keeps it in there? There must be there must be, there yeah. must be something yeah. that keeps it in there, right? Yeah. So we also thought in pushing the theories to, you know, give us also new information as to what they thought, you know, would be the process for that. And here they came up also with two independent predictions. GNW uh, predicted that it was enough to have a, a, an ignition response at the beginning of an experience, uh, ignition response at the end of the experience, and not necessarily any activity in between. And this is more like the idea of like you, you construct time backwards, right? So this is not necessarily that you're experiencing time as it goes, <coughs> but as the, <coughs> as the, as the activity uh, or as the stimulus ends, you reconstruct the duration, right? Um, IAT is very different because IAT really thinks that consciousness is the causal structure. And that causal structure with its connectivity and, and activity Has needs, to, needs yeah. to be maintained, right? So then, you know, now in this case they predicted that all the activity all throughout should be uh, systematic. And the last was what, what type of areas would need to communicate to each other? So for GNW it's very important that the prefrontal cortex, which is where the information is being broadcasted, communicates with higher level visual areas. So we tested for synchrony in this case between this, this area. In the case of IAT, they claim that for you, for instance, to perceive a face, you need to bound the global aspects with the local aspects. In this case, for instance, seeing your, seeing your eyes, you know, your <coughs> nose, and, th and that information is in early visual cortex. So therefore, for them, it was important to have now synchrony between high level visual areas and low level visual areas, right? Um, now, what make the, the, you know, the collaboration interesting and, and, and relevant was also that we tried to dis dissociate the theory leaders from the teams that would collect oh, the data sure. Sure. and would analyze the data to, to try to eliminate to the extent that we could biases that you know are implicit. So then a team, an expert team on fMRI, two, two teams in fact, in fMRI, imaging and, and intracranial, collected the data and analyzed the data, right? We also wanted to do um, you know, go further and look for replication. So what does, what does that mean? We also wanted two teams collecting the same, you know, the state of the same kind. So then we could, you know, in this case, go over the differences, sure. for instance, in the case of subjects, right? Uh, and also to try to, you know, estimate, because if you, if you find a result, you will believe in it if you find it a second time around, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. um, so we, we had a, a, an inbuilt internal replication as well. Right, so then what we tried to do with, with this adversarial collaboration was not only to have the adversaries um, giving the predictions, but also use the whole arsenal of open science. Very important, 
we did a pre-registration. What does that mean? Before the experiments were conducted, we made like a pact, if you wish, where all of these, all the experiments, the table of predictions, the table of outcomes, and how we will interpret them, was um, pre-registered before any of these experiments actually were done, right? Um, partly because, you know, hindsight bias is, is a thing, sure. and you know, we and we learned from Danny Kahneman, who calls this like the 15 IQ point advantage. <laughs> once once you have the data, you can explain them away, yeah. right? And we wanted to you know avoid that to the extent possible. Yeah. Right? And what kind of results did you get that you can report? Um, what was in interesting is that in this case, neither of the theories were confirmed. And as I said, you know, what we take as as as, as important is more like how much evidence we have that they were disconfirmed. And both theories, in fact, um, had significant challenges. So for IAT, we did not observe synchrony, sustained synchrony between early visual areas and, um, and high-level visual cortex, which is a key characteristic for that, or a key prediction for IAT. Um, and for GNW, we did not observe um, the onset and offset responses that they had predicted for the endurance of a <coughs> conscious experience, right? As well as, in prefrontal cortex, we only found evidence for information of certain types, so for instance, category, but not for other types mm. of information. So both of the theories from, from where we stand now will require some mm. sort of revision, right? Um, and overall, I think that what the, the, the advantage of this kind of uh, project is that we can demonstrate that, or we, can, or we can stress test the theories in ways that uh, otherwise it I will think, not happen. I think, I think that's wonderful uh, in terms of, of the work that you've done and, and, and the structure of it. I, I have a uh, more fundamental mm -hmm. problem with it, and that is by forcing the theory to give certain predictions, whether just take brain areas, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it to me is, it doesn't reflect deeply on the on the foundation of that theory. Mm -hmm. So if I look at global workspace theory, uh, its its core idea is some sort of a a a, a global uh, um, activity. And if it hap if that global activity is less in frontal or m more in back, to me that's less important in terms of that theory because it still could it could that theory could could work with uh, IIT it is, a, it is a structural idea, and mm -hmm. sometimes they talk about quality of space and what there's a structure for each consciousness, which is a very deep kind of, of theory, uh, but to me it's not clear that, that that has to be in the parietal lobe or something. That's a, a forced um, sense to try to make it a scientific theory, or make it a testable theory. But if yeah. that's confirmed or denied, doesn't necessarily affect the, the core idea. Uh, yeah. that, that's, that's my concern from yeah. the beginning. I think this is very fair, and I think that this is, uh, this is something to consider. Um, why is it your, you know, your challenge is fair is because both of the theories have, you know, you can think of like a core, like the computational functionalism, you know, like of GNW, which is in this case, like they would, they would predict that there should be an ignition you know, like, or a global broadcasting as right, part of the theory. Right. And, you know, in a sense, we did not test that core prediction, right? You, as much as you said, the, uh, in the case of IAT, it goes beyond just, um, you know, brain, area. brain areas, right? Um, having said that, you know, to make, to make the theories at least to stress test them, you need to bring them to something where they can be measured. Right, and in the case of the functional, comp you know, the, you know, a computational functionalism is something that is really hard to measure, right? Or even, you know, to to prove as a, as an assumption. So we had to reduce those to neuroscientific hypotheses that we could test. Now, of course, the price to pay <laughs> is, you know, how much this will necessarily reflect on the core aspect of yeah, the theory. Yeah. And you can, and you're right that you know, both GNW and IIT can respond to the challenges that we give them by changing, for instance, IIT could say, well, no, we did not need um, <laughs> this area. Or GNW could say, well, we did not need this on and offset response, right? right. And while that is fair, and I think it's an important challenge, at least to me, it's not the, the benefit of these adversarial collaborations. I, I agree, I agree. You, ha you absolutely have that benefit as long as you know that you're not really falsifying, not really, but you're 
yeah. modifying, you're yeah. making them change their predictions and see how their theory develops. So yeah. it's really an ongoing process.